So what I'm going to talk about is culture hacking. And culture hacking is the art and the science of creating healthy cultures where groups of human beings come together and they help elevate each other. And by helping to elevate each other, they do better in class or they do better as a company or they do better as a nonprofit or an organization. And there's a reason I'm obsessed by this. And the reason I'm obsessed by this is because life kind of put me in a place where I ended up indirectly leading a lot of different tribes, from the tribe at Mind Valley to Mind Valley University to our tribe at AFEST, which is another group of like 400 incredible individuals who come together for this TED-like event. And I somehow ended up being put through the randomness of life as a community builder. But there's a reason, I think, I was able to do this effectively. And that reason is that I actually have an issue with my brain that I only recently started publicly speaking about. See, I have Asperger's syndrome, which means that I am on the spectrum of autism. And what this means is that while many people here can relate to other human beings very easily because you can read body language, when you have Asperger's, one of the things is that you don't read body language. And so I grew up and trying to have one-on-one -on -one communication with other human beings was really tough for me. So as a teenager, I never had any friends. My entire teenage life, I went out five times. And I never even dated because I couldn't understand dating because dating is so based on, on eye signals and the fluttering of a woman's eyes, and I couldn't get any of that. So it was, it was like a blank canvas. I was blind to it. So imagine if 70% of human communication is nonverbal and you can't pick up these nonverbal cues, you are very literal. Now, it did give me some advantages. I'm a computer programmer. I see the world in logic. I'm very direct. It's because with me, it's all about logic. It made me really good at pattern recognition, but really sucky at one-on-one -on -one relationships because I don't have the abilities that other people have. So I, I now go to a lab. I work with electrodes on my brain. They stimulate the areas of my brain, and, and they help activate those areas. But if you're a parent and you have a child who has Asperger's, you know what it's like. Growing up, I didn't look people in the eye because when you have this condition, you don't look at the eye. The eye is uncomfortable. You look at the mouth. And I remember recently someone asking someone from my team, you know, I don't think I can trust vision because when he talks to me, he never looks at me in the eye. There's something fishy about him. And the team member had to, without revealing my condition, explain that, you know, that different people have different neurological issues. We have neurological diversities, and we shouldn't be too quick to judge. But again, not being able to look people in the eye means that very often when I'm at an event like this, um, one of you will come up to me and go, Vishen, you didn't look me in the eye, and I felt that was really rude. And then I have to <laughs> indirectly make an excuse. And, and it also means that when I'm with a group of people, a large group of people, I get intense social anxiety, right? Um, so I always have someone from my team by my side, and it's nothing personal. When, when you have this condition, meeting large groups of people is tough. Growing up, I was labeled the shy kid. I was labeled the impolite kid, because when relatives came to the house, it was so difficult of me to greet them. Simple things like, hello, goodbye, thank you, I couldn't process. So it was very hard for me. When I got a gift, it was hard for me to say thank you because I couldn't, my mind is so logical, I couldn't pick up the fact that thank you was simply a human cultural statement to acknowledge the other person, unless you explain it to me, right? And so I didn't have the easiest childhood. I didn't have friends. I never dated till I was 22. And, and the flip side of that is that whatever that condition cost me, it also gave me an advantage. And that advantage is that while one-on-one -on -one communication is tough, when I look at big groups of people, I can see the code that you guys are operating in. My pattern recognition is off the hook. So I can see patterns in religion, in society, in culture that other people don't notice. I can watch a group of people and I can see what's going on. And then, using my brain, I can hack those patterns. Asperger's is often like being an idiot savant. You, are, you, have, you don't have abilities in certain areas, but you have really high IQ, really high cognitive ability in other areas. That, for me, is pattern recognition. So as a child, if you tested me on social stuff, I would fail. You tested me on an IQ stuff, I would score at the gifted level. What I'm going to share with you here is some of the things that I created 
with this enhanced patent recognition so that I could build a company like Mind Valley and I could be a tribe builder. And maybe, you know, sometimes the, the handicaps that God or the universe give us often give us an edge in another area. I wanted to confess my handicap so you know that I'm anything but, 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 but brilliant in many ways. I, I'm, I'm not. I have my deficiencies. I have my flaws. I have my insecurities. I suck at certain things. But there's one thing I believe is a gift that I can share. And that's what I want to do today, if that's cool with you guys. So, so that's my family. Um, and over the years, as, as I've grown, it was only in my mid-30s that I started to, to, through feedback from friends and, and people who cared about me, who would tell me, Vision, you cannot say that at a dinner party. You cannot, you got to start looking people at the eye that I started picking up. So now I almost seem normal. Um, <laughs> but the gift that this gave me was the ability to build Mind Valley as a company and to build Mind Valley University and to create events like A Fest and to create all of Mind Valley's beautiful culture. Now, why is culture important, right? No matter where you are, if you're starting a business, if you have anything that you want to build in the world today, we no longer live in a society where it's just you. Today, we need teams. The world is so complex. Anything you want to build, whether it's an app or a t-shirt company or the next big scientific innovation, you need people around you. And there's a science to get that people to link up to you, to have that shared vision, to collaborate with you, to create in a beautiful way where you are productive, but also having fun. Now, one of the guys I, I managed to interview when I was developing these models, see, my next book is going to be called Code of the Extraordinary Team. The first one was Code of the Extraordinary Mind. What you're learning here are principles I'm developing for Code of the Extraordinary Team. It's coming out in 18 months. One of the guys I interviewed was this man. Richard Branson. And one day, <laughs> when we were in Necker Island, and by the way, when you're hanging out with Richard, you're in togas, you're wearing leaves in your hair, your nipple is showing. You know, <laughs> he's all about happiness and culture, right? And by the way, he also had his neurological issue. His was dyslexia. So parents, if you have a child who have one of these, these issues and the school has called you in and told you that your kid has Asperger's or dyslexia, relax, they might probably be on stage here someday. So I asked Branson, how, how is it that you could start 300 different companies with 300 different individuals and have an organization with 50,000 employees and, and live life so effortlessly, always in a state of flow, always in a state of fun? And this is what he told me. It's about finding and hiring people smarter than you, getting them to join your business and giving them good work, then getting out of their way and trusting them. You have to get out of the way so that you can focus on the vision. That was the first clue. So how do you do that? This is going to be the topic of today's talk. We're going to talk about how to attract and build teams of committed individuals to rally around a vision and make your business thrive. And I feel that this is one of the missing ingredients in many business school programs. When you are looking at a startup, we often look at the business model, we look at the pricing strategy, but often one of the most important things is the culture that that startup is going to create. Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what you're learning here indirectly is not just to persuade people to come and see your vision and help you build it, but how to create healthy culture. And in the process, make your work more fun keep people longer, grow your business, make people care, make your team happier, and make your customers love you. But there's a flip side to this. When you do this right, you also create extraordinary heroes. You create people in your company who become brilliant at what they do. They become greater versions of themselves. And they, if they share that mission, you just gained allies. You go from Superman to becoming the Justice League. You get what I'm saying? Now, why work? Why am I focusing on work in this presentation? It's because you guys know what Mind Valley wants to do for education. But work is one of those aspects of life that we as adults spend 70% of our waking hours on. But if you look at the data, work kind of sucks. According to Gallup, 87% of people around the world dislike their jobs. If you look at America, right? 
One of the wealthiest countries in the world, 54% of Americans, according to Gallup, dislike their job. Work makes us sicker. It makes us less happy. Yet work is what we spend the majority of our waking hours on. But what if we could flip that? What if work could be the new campus? Work could be a place where we form community. Work could be a place where we grow into the best ind individuals we can be. And what if, my, my latest obsession, if what is work can be designed so it actually increases human lifespan? See, our last AFES was on longevity. And in a study on longevity, they found that if you have these criteria, you live longer, being religious or spiritual, having a life purpose, older and younger people living together, that's community, a healthy social network. Now, by the way, all of these boil down to one thing, community. See, being religious or spiritual, why it leads to longevity is not because you're reading the Bible every day, it's because religious or spiritual people go to church or they go to meditation retreats and they connect deeply with other people. When it comes to religion, we really connect deeply on it because it's so, such an ingrained part of our soul. Likewise, having a life purpose, older and younger people living together, a healthy social network, all of these can be engineered into a company. So what I'm trying to do is create a new model for building a company where when you work, you actually become healthier. You have a bigger social network. You have friends. You love what you do. You get out of bed excited about going to work. Because in the last couple of decades, loneliness has gone up. So Harvard Business Review just, just released a study. Loneliness is up 300%. And loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Let me repeat that. Loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, let me ask you this, right? How many of you here are CEOs? Raise your hand. CEOs. That's a high percentage of CEOs. In America, 50% of CEOs state that they are lonely. I've been there too. 50% of CEOs. It seems that even in work, as you got, go closer to the top, the lonelier it gets. And loneliness, loneliness is not just as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, it's worse for you than obesity. So again, you can see that there is an important drive here. Whether it's for the manager or the CEO, we have to shift the way we design work so that we can not just do a better job and get a product or a service out, but so that we spend 70% of our waking hours being healthy, being communal, being fulfilled, and making this the best time of our life. Do you guys agree? So. For the sake of the people who are watching this on, on Facebook and, and may not know what Mind Valley is, you guys know, obviously, you came here to spend 30 days with us, so you really know what Mind Valley is. But for those of you watching on Facebook, I'm just going to give a quick, quick explanation of Mind Valley, the company, so that you guys understand, later understand, the processes that we've put in place. So our goal is to touch a billion lives and change education globally. Our goal is to take transformational education and plug it into every major schooling system in the world, at least 100 countries, and every company in the Fortune 500. And the reason is, we want to create the biggest up-leveling in human consciousness humanity has ever seen, and do it in the next 20 years, because humanity is at a tipping point. We are actually about to leave our children and Earth worse off than when we inherited it. We want to fix that. And the cure to almost every global ill, divisive politics, destruction of the ecology, pollution, lies in educating our young. So our goal is simply to reboot human education globally, every nation, every country, every university, every school, by injecting consciousness, wisdom, and transformation into the educating of our young so we can create a new flowering of humanity. And we do this by investing in great technology, recruiting the world's greatest teachers, creating beautiful events that we then want to scale. And one of the ways we do it is by truly experimenting with work. Now, none of this would be possible, though, without the people I work with, this incredible team. And what's cool about this team is it's now 300 people, and they come from 49 different countries. After all, if you want to take a global mission like that, you can't just be doing this with Americans or with Europeans. You've got to fully get a team that embraces and represents the entire world. Now, what's unique about the Mind Valley team is that we actually get applications from people all around the world to want to join Mind Valley. So many that we stop looking at resumes. 
And if you practice what I'm about to teach you, you can create the same flood in your company. So if we put up a single job ad, we get 2,000 resumes. So we said, no, that, that's crazy. We don't want to go through 2,000 resumes. So the only way to get a job is to submit a video cover letter. Now it goes down to 20 video cover letters because video cover letters take a lot more time. You can BS on them. And now from these 20 video cover letters, we choose the right candidate. And if you were to go to YouTube and type in Mind Valley cover letters, you will see thousands of them from all around the world. So we create this culture that is able to move forward on this massive global mission of transforming education while attracting talent from all around the world. And then this is really cool. Even though we are based in Malaysia, which is not like one of the coolest cities in the world, like nobody ever says, someday I'm going to move to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> but still, we keep people longer than Microsoft, Yahoo, eBay, Apple, Amazon, Google, or Facebook, right? So our retention rates uh, for these young millennials are longer than these companies. And part of it is, of course, because of what we're doing with our culture. So here's a classic example of how that works, right? This is a picture of our customer support team, not today, but, but around maybe two years ago. And many of these individuals are actually here at Mind Valley U. But when that picture was sent to me, by the head of that team, Christy, who's actually now working behind the scenes at Mind Value, she sent me the slide. She noticed that every single person on her team came from a different country. And this was just automatic. It was just randomness. It wasn't planned. We weren't saying, oh, we got too many Americans today. Let's hire a Canadian. It just happened so, right? But here's what's really cool. This same team got awarded best customer support team in Asia by Nice Reply out of 10,000 other teams. There's a power when you can attract great people from across the world and, and let that diversity like just magnify each other's potential. You create great functioning teams. So what I'm going to share today are seven keys. And I'm going to go really fast. We're going to be spending around two hours and 20 minutes together. There's going to be a 10-minute break in between. So roughly two, and a half, two hours, 10 minutes of training. You're going to need a workbook because we're going to go into a workshop. I'm going to ask you to think about certain things in your head, write certain things down. I'm going to ask for deep audience interaction. Is that cool, guys? Yeah. And these ideas are going to work for you whether you run a team, so you don't have to be a business owner, you could be a team manager, whether you run a community of some sort, whether you are a teacher in a school, you run a service company, it, you run a small business, it applies if you have a larger company, a small team, if you're solo and need to make your first hire, or if you're building any sort of tribe. Who here feels that any of these categories apply to them? Great. Who feels, uh-uh, no, I don't fall in any of these categories. If you don't, it's totally cool. Medieval days is happening in Tallinn. Go enjoy yourself. It's awesome. Okay, now, let's get started. In my book, I used a phrase called brule. Can anybody define brule? Mic runners, please. Can anybody go deeper? That, that, that's pretty cool. Okay, so rules are bullshit rules that we adopt to simplify our understanding of the world, right? To simplify our understanding. And what we're going to do here is look at certain words that we toss out as human society that many of us don't bother to dig in and go deeper with. Words like perks. So we think, oh wow, I'm trying to create great culture, I got to have perks. If I'm starting a company, I've got to figure out how to recruit employees. What if perks are nonsense? What if employees, according to one researcher, employeeship is going to disappear in 10 years? Work is changing that fast. Culture. I'm going to deconstruct culture because many Silicon Valley companies think culture is giving away free food and having a beautiful office. Bullshit. It's not that. And we're going to look at the word job. We're going to deconstruct the word job. We're going to I, I hate that word. J-O-B is like a dirty three-letter word to me. What if we could replace these with other concepts? I gave an example at the start of Mind Value, replacing the word job with ikigai, right? Ikigai is a Japanese concept rather than what is your job, what is your ikigai? And ikigai simply means doing work that you love, that you can be paid for, that you can be best in the world at, and that the world needs. Super simple, but so much more elegant than job, right? So we're going to look at these words, perks, jobs, employeeship, even the word office, completely deconstruct them. 
and you need to have an open mind. Because if you are stuck within these words, a lot of what I say will sound alien to you. It will sound impossible. But if you realize that these words and the words of Steve Jobs were made up by people no smarter than you because they didn't know better, now you're going to have a blank canvas to create new types of businesses for the world. Yes or yes? So, how I got started on this journey was when I graduated and I moved to Silicon Valley and I tried to start a company and I failed. I decided to to basically um, get a job in in sales. And I told you guys the story at the start of Mind Valley U. I took a class on meditation. I learned how to unlock these superpowers. So transformation became a big part of my life, and eventually I became a meditation instructor. So now it was 2003. And I was a meditation instructor in New York, and the company that I was running my classes with was simply called Mind Valley. That was it, Mind Valley, and that was me back in 2003. You can see I was just getting started out. I had a little bit more hair, but I could barely afford pants. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on a Toshiba laptop. Toshiba was like the hottest laptop back then. This was before the Apple revolution. But what is funny is that chair and that table that I'm sitting on, I salvaged from the street. New York, really friendly city. You don't need to buy furniture. Every time Ikea comes up with a new catalog, all your neighbors start tossing out their old Ikea shit. You just go out there and you pick it up. Now that table, so it wasn't like an, an era of abundance for me. In fact, funnily enough, that table on the IKEA catalog is actually called the LAC, the L-A-C-K. It's like IKEA named it, 1495. IKEA named it because it knows that if you're using that table, you are lacking something in your life. <laughs> so there I was on my IKEA LAC table, appropriately named, trying to build and figure out how to make the first Mind Valley website. Right now, this was New York in 2000. Three. And that was my apartment. So all of this was happening in that seedy little apartment above the Celtic pub, now called the play, uh, back then it was called the Playwrights Tavern. Now this is Times Square. If you go to Times Square today, Times Square is amazing. It's lit up, there's the Little Mermaid playing on Broadway, and then Disney's Lion King. Today Times Square is run by Disney. Back then, Times Square was run by, by pimps and crack dealers. So this was New York of 2003. Two years before I moved into that, that apartment, guys, seriously, it was a Thai massage parlor, which is code in New York for whorehouse. So yes, you guys are here at Mind Valley University, and yes, we did start out in a whorehouse. <laughs> so I then got added to... So what happened back then in 2003 is this was two years after September 11, right? And this is when America was a very different place. And I got added to a watch list uh, for suspicious people who potentially might be of Muslim origin and are brown and occasionally unshaven. And what this meant is that I could no longer board planes after, unless I went for a two-hour interview. I could no longer use certain airports. And worse, every 28 days, I had to report to the government to get fingerprinted, photographed, and to give them my credit cards so they could check my purchases in case I bought fertilizer or something. So after living in America for almost a decade, my wife and I got married. She was Estonian. She was living in New York with me. We realized we couldn't continue living there. But remember, everything in life happens for a reason. I'm so glad that happened. Three months into it, after three months of every 28 days lining up in the cold in the middle of winter in front of the government office down in, in um, um, the southern tip of New York to wait to go for another stupid, pointless interview called special registration, right? I decided to quit. And we thought, well, we could go to Estonia or we could go to Malaysia. Estonia back then wasn't the incredible startup hub it is right now. It was just known as a cold country. So we ended up going to Malaysia, and that's how Mind Valley ended up in Kuala Lumpur. Now, by the way, guys, um, those of you watching on Facebook, I am not a threat to your life um, or, or your way of life. Uh, I got off the watch list in 2008 when President Obama ruled it unconstitutional. Um, so thank you, Obama. I'm not in America now because Trump wants to bring it back. It's called, it's, this is the same Muslim watch list or Muslim ban that he's bringing back right now. So until America has another election and hopefully this time does not vote a reality TV star into power, I'm not going to look at bringing, opening up an office in America. So I'm waiting till 2020 because I don't want to go through that shit again, guys. It was painful. But now, 
universe has put me exactly where I need to be, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, except that there is a problem. In 2003, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, the country is going through brain drain, right? So the first problem is that all my partners, all my clients, all our vendors are US-based. I'd spent 10 years in the US, but now Malaysia is losing 1% of its population every year. 1%. And these were the smartest individuals. They were moving to Canada or the US or to Hong Kong, any place where you know, they could build a better life. And so my friends told me, don't come back to Malaysia. There's no way you can actually build a successful company here. Go, you know, just deal with that stupid government shit in America. Just go through that, that, that humiliating thing every four weeks. But I couldn't. I, I felt offended by that. I just could not. So I decided to stay in Malaysia. And it was hard getting people. My first employee was actually my dog, um, Aussie Labradoodle. This is funny. So I, I, I got a dog because I was so bored and lonely, named him Aussie because I imported him from Australia, put him on the website, and we actually got covered in Wyatt magazine um, as a cool little company in Malaysia with a dog using our P doing our PR. So it did get us good PR. Aussie didn't have to do jack shit. Just by being a dog in PR, he got his PR. It was a brilliant move. But now I need it to break out of this like, pattern of mediocrity. So when you're faced with a difficult situation, you have two choices. You can, you can complain, you can whine, or you can, in the words of Buckminster Fuller, create a new vision to make the existing vision irrelevant. So I thought, if there's brain drain in Malaysia, if you can't get talent in Malaysia, hmm, why don't I just create a vision that renders that whole notion N nonsensical. I decided I was going to create the world's greatest workplace in Malaysia. And what I was going to do then is suck the brains from other countries and bring them to Malaysia. So we decided to do just that. And over the next five years, working with Christina, working with my then partner, Mike, we started building up Mind Valley. We started winning awards for having the best office in Malaysia. We started attracting talent from all around the world. And before long, this vision of being one of the world's greatest places to work, started emerging. It's kind of funny, right? When you declare something really bold, people who are crazy like you, they know that crazy people change the world. So crazy people start joining you. So all our first employees were all like batshit crazy like me. But we had so much fun together, and then this vision started becoming real. And soon, we were truly an international company. And we had employees from all around the work world who were coming to Malaysia and working in Kuala Lumpur to build up Mind Valley. Now, this is how this is how insane it got. Today, if you walk into Mind Valley HQ in Malaysia, they are 40 plus countries in that one office. 40 plus nationalities represented by passports in that one office. Maybe about a 50 different languages spoken. Everyone communicates in English, but the diversity is is incredible. And um, this became one of the most um, powerful advantages our company had. We had all of these people with their skills, with their ideas, with their diverse viewpoints, rallying around a shared vision to reform education. So that crappy situation was what allowed us to become who we are. But here's the other cool part. We were able to build all of this with no funding, just $700 and that Toshiba laptop put back in the company over and over and over and over again. So till now, less than 1% of Mind Valley is owned by investors. And that's given us like abilities that most companies don't have. Less than 1%. And when people ask me, what was the, how were we able to do that? Culture. It was getting the best people and focusing like crazy on culture. See, if we had investors who had put in a large amount of money in the company, we would not be able to do Mind Valley U. Because Mind Value is not designed for profit. We'd not be able to do AFES. We wouldn't be able to share so much of our company processes on our blog because investors don't want you sharing how you do things with the competition. We wouldn't be able to take on schools in Finland because we're going to lose a lot of money on that in the first couple of years because you can't make money from school kids. So a lot of the things that we are now able to do, we can do and other companies can't do because Mind Valley doesn't have to look at shareholder value. We don't have to look at paying back our investors. We just have to figure out the best damn way we can rally people together to change the world. But the superpower was culture. It doesn't happen fast, it took about a decade, but that superpower, culture, fueled it. Now, 
if any of you are wondering, this may not apply to me. So I want to share with you a couple of myths, a couple of myths on workplace design that I think hold people back from, from taking this route, from focusing truly on culture. So if you look at Mind Valley today, like just our team photos look like they're magazine ads, right? Everyone is, is amazing, everyone looks great. You look at our, that is our team photo from 2005. You can see we are literally trying to look smarter than we are by posing <laughs> with, with, with all of the online digital courses we bought on marketing. Now, that is the About Us page of Mind Valley. That's just a snapshot of our About Us page showing Mind Valley teams and offices around the world. That was our About Us page back then. But remember, our About Us page 2005 was me and a dog. This is the Hall of Awesomeness. We have an auditorium in the hottest neighborhood in Kuala Lumpur that holds 150 people, so we can have our weekly team meetings. People who come, uh, new people who join Mind Valley take an oath on a little statue of Wonder Woman. So right now, that looks amazing, right? But this was our auditorium 10 years ago. You can see we used a whiteboard as a screen projector, um, and the plant behind me has precisely nine leaves. We couldn't afford leaves, folks. Leaves were expensive back then. This is one of our offices. It's just one of the meeting rooms in Mind Valley HQ today. You can see it's freaking beautifully designed. That was our meeting room back in 2005. That poor girl, you can see how sad she looks because she doesn't have a desk. She's using a chair to support her laptop. We didn't even have nails to hang the posters on the wall, I think. They're just, they're just lying on these desks. Um, that's the Christmas card. We sent our um, authors and our partners. This must have been like four or five years ago. You can see Jason Campbell there dressed as Santa Claus. But this is the Christmas card I sent out in 2003. <laughs> My cat has still not forgiven me for that. No team. I had to show I had support. had a cat <laughs> and a dog. Um, that's the pantry where people cook food. Uh, this is the... that pantry that Luke was talking about, where he has all of these amazing conversations with people. But back in 2005, our pantry was that table filled with the best Nestle three-in-one coffee money could buy. <laughs> so no matter where you're starting, you can start sucky, you can start small, you can still apply these ideas. When I had that crappy little office back in a warehouse in a ghetto part of KL, I still knew in my mind this was going to be the world's greatest workplace. And that's the key thing. you got to create that vision of what you want to create. And if the real world doesn't match that, it doesn't matter. Because we live in two worlds. We live in the real world, but we also live in the world of imagination. We live in the, the world of ideas, of visions, of beliefs, what's going on in our head. And that vision was real inside here before it was manifest real in the real world. And whatever ideas you get here, whatever new thoughts or visions for how you want to build your workplace, my request to you is make it real inside. You don't have to share it with people, but make it real inside and know that if I can do that, and that didn't happen fast, it took about a decade, but it was a, still a massive leap, you can do that too. All of us have inside us the same powers to create, to shape reality, to, to tap into unseen powers to make those visions come true. So hold on to that vision, no matter how sucky, no matter how small, no matter how black and white your workplace may be now. Okay, so let's get to the seven keys. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. Step one is creating attraction. Now, this is where we're going to go into workshop mode. So I want you to have your pen and your papers ready. So the first step is know that job ads are stupid. Job ads are written because of this rule that people need a nine to five, right? People, job ads target ordinary people who are stuck in an ordinary way of life. So this is a typical job ad that I pulled up from Craigslist. Salon manager, part-time, Los Angeles, San Francisco Valley, growing company looking for part-time salon manager to help in a unique upscale, availability to work flexible day schedules, Monday through Friday. Please visit our website, Salon Republic, for additional information about our company. Now, if you go to the website, it's just the job ad. Don't do that. I want to show you a new way of writing your job ad, okay? So, typical job ads suck because people, in the words of Simon Sinek, don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. 
People don't buy what you do; they buy why you do it. In the world, if you simply advertise your job, you become vanilla. You become plain. But if you talk about why you do what you do, if you appeal to the why, you somehow arouse something in people. People now start paying more attention. For whatever reason, human beings are hardwired to connect, not based on the what, but on the why. When somebody knows why you designed the company to do what you do, why you're writing the book you're writing, why you are building that service or that product or that app you're building, you connect with them in a different way. So this is what I want to suggest your job website should look like. Firstly, you can check this out. In your time, when you, if you go to careers.mindvalley.com, but I'm going to deconstruct it for you. So, firstly, notice when you come to the website, the first thing we talk about is the why, and it says, "Shape the future of humanity by working on the future of education." Shape the future of humanity by working on the future of education. Now, the next thing is, we say, "Interested in a job? Let's go through a couple of steps." Step one: Does our mission excite you? And then we explain why. Education, according to Mandela, is the most powerful weapon in which you can use to change the world. If the mission doesn't excite them, we ask them to bail. We only want to work with people who care about reforming education. So you want to understand what is your why. And in a moment, we're going to do an exercise to help you identify your why. Now, the second technique is that after you state your why, you state your manifesto, and your manifesto is what you. As the business owner or the manager, believe should be different about work. So, way back in 2005, this is what our website looked like, and we had a manifesto. And this is really how we started attracting the first people. I wrote this manifesto when it was just me and my dog Ozzy, right? And it said ten reasons to join Mind Valley: freedom, great people. I didn't mention that the only other great person there was a dog. Right, Ozzy was people. I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so it was technically true. Freedom, great people, culture and perks, training and education. We wrote a manifesto. Now, this manifesto may seem regular today, but back then in 2005, this was revolutionary. It was different, and so we started getting people applying. Today, we have a different manifesto, and you can see this again if you go to our career website, careers.mindvalley.com. For example, the first item in our manifesto says. We are not an American company, nor a Malaysian company, but an Earth company. Immediately, that speaks to certain individuals. We talk about how we innovate rapidly to stay on the leading edge of exponential change. Developers, programmers, they want to hear that. They don't want to work on like boring maintenance work. They want to innovate. We talk about why we believe happiness is the single most powerful tool for productivity. And then we have a picture of our team at a fancy dress party. Certain type of people. That value happiness in the workplace. Those are the people we want, because as you'll see later, people with high levels of positive, positive energy actually improve workspace productivity. We talk about we stand up for what we believe in, and we have a sample app that we released、um, to encourage people to stand up for refugees. Right? We actually created advertising to support these values. We stand up for what we believe in. So, by designing this manifesto, we're immediately speaking. To the exact type of persona we want in the company, and remember, we started this back when we looked like that, because we knew no one was going to join us because of a fancy office. But we still got people to join us. Our first applicant came from Atlanta, Georgia. Second came from Singapore. The third came from Finland. All of these people traveled halfway around the world to join and work from that office, because the manifesto spoke to them. So again. It's not about your office space. It's not about the sexiness of your product. It's about what's inside you, and this is what I want you to understand. You see, there is an underlying reason people take jobs, and we often underestimate that. I've interviewed maybe three, four thousand people, and I notice that what people are really looking for in a job is not a salary check. It's not a nine to five. Especially millennials, these in order are the four things they are looking for. They want to grow. They want to be happy. To wake up every day, know that you know they're going to be stepping into a workplace where they have friendships. They want to have meaning in their lives. They want to know that their lives matter for something. And the fourth thing is they want abundance. They want to know that they'll be able to afford the things that they want. And I found that in that order, those were the people who I was attracting. And so. 
every time I interview someone, and you can adopt the same methodology, I take out this image on my iPad, and I tell them, I'm going to give you 10 coins. Now, I want you to do this exercise with me in your head. You have 10 coins. Think carefully. Where would you place these 10 coins in terms of happiness, abundance, growth, and meaning? Now, some people might put three on happiness. Some might put all 10 on meaning. But usually, people scatter them out. Where would you put yours? And I want to ask for a volunteer. Just raise your hand if you've, if you've thought of this and are willing to share. Mike Runners, go ahead. I would put it all on happiness. How many would you put on happiness out of the 10? All of them. Okay. Okay, so that, that's unusual. Well in, for, well, in my life path, my deprivation is of happiness. And so I know that I grow when I'm happy because my, in my life path, I've noticed that my happiest areas were when I was fully abundant, when I had the meaning, and when I was growing. Okay, well, let me go further and tell you how different companies engineer this, and then maybe it'll become more apparent. People who value happiness most will be attracted to companies like Google, like Facebook, with their beautiful office, with their incredible perks. Facebook has a massive campus for its employees. Everyone is like, it's kind of like young and millennial and you get free food and you have like an arcade where you can go play games. That's happiness. Abundance are people who might, you, you can go ahead and sit down. Abundance are people who might decide that they want to spend 10 to 12 years of their life working as a stockbroker. 100 hour weeks, right? They don't care about getting married. They don't want to have kids. They just want to plow through those 100 hour weeks for 10 years, make a shit ton of money, and then in their 40s go and do something they really enjoy. And that's cool too. It's a choice. Now, growth is someone who might take a job as an apprentice. Low, low money, but they get to learn from a master. I took a lot of my early jobs as an apprentice to guys who were masters at a craft I wanted to learn for like a base salary. Meaning means you might work for, say, the United Nations. My wife worked for the UNHCR to support refugees. Horrible job because you are, you are seeing misery every single day. But she did it because it was meaningful. So again, all of us, we have these combinations. Let's try another one. Someone raise your hand. Okay, with it. Wait for the mic, please, with it. So Mike Runners, why don't you actually stay in the front? It'll be easier. Let's have two, because the room is pretty big. So I go from growth and then clockwise. So um, four, three, two, one. Okay, so you'd put four on growth, three on happiness, two on abundance, one on meaning. Um, actually, no, sorry. Uh, um, two on meaning, one on abundance. Okay, right. so let's try to understand with its mentality. Let's pretend we're interviewing with it. With it, tell us, why would you divide it this way? Okay, so I am 21 right now, right? I have a lot of years to... So with it, hold the mic to yeah. your mouth. I know actually, you're using yeah, your yeah. hands. No, I'm pretty loud, so I didn't want to uh, uh, bring it very close. Yeah, so growth for me is right now the biggest thing in right. my life. Because, uh, you know, at 21, I am inexperienced. Right. And, uh, you know, getting depth of things and growing is the biggest right. thing. Why? No, I said right. Yeah. Then uh, second comes happiness because, you know, if I am growing, I should be happy with that growth. If I'm not, then I'm growing in the wrong field. Mm -hmm. um, uh, abundance, um, I think the lifestyle that I want to live right now is not of abundance. At this age, if I'm living of abundance, then right. what am I going to look up to? And uh, I think when I'm learning and going in depth, meaning will come along. Right. Yeah. So what with it is saying, because with it's 21, is very, very, very typical of people under 35. They tend to value the right side, happiness and growth. When you're speaking to people over 40, they tend to value the left side, abundance and meaning. Right? So it doesn't matter, but what you'll find is that your company will have its own DNA. In our company, the biggest edge we provide is actually growth, because we're a personal growth company. Happiness is also cool. Abundance is maybe not that high, because we are based in Kuala Lumpur, right? You can earn a lot more working in Norway or New York, and meaning very, very, very high. So if there's someone who comes to Mind Valley and they don't give a damn about education, but what they really want to do is be super wealthy and work a hundred hour weeks and save up, we're not the right company. And we openly will say that to a candidate. So you are identifying your company DNA on this matrix and using it to help you find the right candidate. So the tip is 
Use this when you interview, because when these DNAs match, it almost becomes like, like a glove fitting a hand, and you're more likely to find the right people who will stay with you. Okay, so this is a really, really important protocol. So the manifesto technique, really easy. We went through that. And we're going to go to step two. But before we go to step two, what I want to reiterate to you guys is that you can start advertising your meaning. You can start writing your manifesto, even if your workplace looks like that. And now I want to do an exercise with someone. I want a volunteer to come up on stage and I'm going to work with you to help take what your company does and give it meaning. Can I have a volunteer, please? You right there, you put up your hand, come up on stage. And go ahead and grab that mic. Please give him a round of applause. So tell us your name. My name is Shil. Your name is? Shil. Shil. And where are you from, Shil? From Switzerland. From Switzerland. Shil, so just so tell us what is it, face the audience, and Shil, tell us what is it that your company does. So my company uh, connect participants to clinical trails and clinical studies. And we're based in Switzerland and we have a platform where we connect them. Okay, so you have a platform that connects participants to clinical trials and clinical studies. Now, if you put that on a job ad, do you think you are going to get a flood of applicants? Um, In many cases, not so much. Why do you do what you do? I do what I do, it's because I kind of like to drive and to do something and it's oh this is going to be a challenging one yeah. so, so you do what you do because you like to drive and do something yeah okay and it's just like i, I need to I, I love to to challenge things and to work on this and yeah okay so now 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 we're coming to something we're coming to something right now what is the contribution that your company is making to the world? So, in our culture is to take young people. So we have our people working are 20 to 21, and I'm 21, and we want to um, take people who are in the universities and all the cl clinical trails and clinical researches to take them and make something out of it uh, in the IT and in the young people area. So that's our contribution. Okay. So you're, so you're taking these people who are working in clinical trials and you are making them what? Are you making them more efficient? Um, I give them a meaning to, to drive with me and not to follow like the system and okay. to wait. Well, let me tell you, that, let me ask you this. What would happen if your company didn't exist? Um, what, what would it be like if your company didn't exist? Well, firstly, now before you ask yourself that question, magnify your company. Ask yourself, what will Switzerland look like if my company was a thousand times bigger? Or what will Europe look like if my company was a thousand times bigger? Give me an idea. How would the world be better off if your company was a thousand times bigger? So there were definitely more consciousness and more fun. In and what? In people's head. Mm -hmm. So why? Why? Why true clinical trials? Um, that's a hard question. So, so I want all of you to ask this question with me, okay? So, and you're going to do this in your head with me, mm -hmm. okay? Now, not saying it's going to be easy, but we're going to do our best. Let's look at Mind Valley. First, I take where we are right now, and I magnify it a thousand times, okay? Which, and if it was magnified a thousand times, what this means is that we would have 300 million people globally studying transformation and learning how to be healthier, how to be wiser, how to bring mindfulness into their lives. We will likely be in massive companies across Europe, in schooling systems across the world, teaching young children practices of mindfulness, of self-esteem, teaching adults conscious parenting, 300 million people living their best lives. So I've magnified it. Now I make that disappear. If we didn't exist, life is as it is. Human beings are stressed out. Kids are learning the same crap they're learning right now. Companies are continuing to, create, to operate like factory. 
87% of people around the world are continuing to hate their jobs. Now, you make that comparison. So why you do what you do is the difference between you not existing and you existing times 1,000%, times 1,000x, right? So now I can say that why we exist is to enlighten hundreds of millions of people and create a new consciousness on earth. Okay? Now, what will the world look like if your company was 1,000x bigger? And you guys do this in your head with your business or service too. My company would look like a, fee, uh, a culture or a, a field or a area of consciousness and where people can be who they are, who they truly are, and can contribute to, this, to the company and the company contribute to the world. How does the company contribute to the world? If, uh, it's a very hard question because, it, yeah. Why are clinical trials important? Clinical trials are so important because it's, it's for um, making studies and prove something when professors or whoever has ideas to develop, so they need participants and... Okay, so that's good, so that's good. So clinical trials are important because they help validate studies. They help, they help these professors with these ideas validate the ideas and get these out. And so innovation speeds up. Exactly. Okay, so your company helps fuel innovation in science and technology. And humanity, yeah. And humanity, perfect. Okay, so that already is a much better opening statement. Help fuel innovation in science and technology. You see how that works? Yeah. Okay, now, when you magnify that a thousand X, you start creating the rest of that story. Do you want to take a stab at it? That's okay. You've already done a good job, but you guys can see how. Now, what was the initial statement you said? The initial statement of what your company does? Um, connecting. The initial statement when you, when you first got up here. When I asked you, what does your company do? It's... Um we have a platform where we connect the participants to the clinical trails. Yeah, don't say that. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I'm going to call up someone else. And then I'm going to explain. Yeah, come on up. So this, the statement becomes, help fuel innovation in science and technology. Now, there's another reason for that, right? If you say, see, if, I, if my statement for Mind Valley back in 2008 was what we did, it would say, we build websites for personal growth teachers. That's cool if you're a web developer and if you like personal growth teachers, but it's not, it's not inspiring. So you don't say what you do. You say what you, what you plan on doing. You look 10 years into the future. Okay, here's another example, but, but, and this is just before we come to you. Elon Musk, Elon Musk, runs a company called SpaceX. And if you have heard of SpaceX and Elon Musk, now what is SpaceX? SpaceX is nothing more than a giant trucking company. But except, then, except rather than send cargo this way, he's sending cargo this way. It's a giant freaking trucking company for, for space. But he doesn't call it a trucking company, does it? If you go to SpaceX's website, what it says is, we are here to make mankind an interplanetary species. That's it. He's not looking at what he does now. He's multiplying that 1,000x, looking 10 years into the future and describing that vision. But when you describe it that way, you go from being a trucking company to the International Space Station to actually having this whole field of possibilities you can, you can expand into. If I said Mind Valley 10 years ago was a company that built websites, we'd still be building websites. But now we do so much more. We can build universities. We can transform global education because I never said we built websites, even though that was what we did. I said, we want to transform global education. The wider you go, not only do you attract the right people, but it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. These crazy people who join you, they help expand your mission. So your mission and your vision and what you do becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you describe what you do, you attract people who just do that. 
And then you continue becoming very good at that, but you don't truly expand into other fields. So you want to make your company like in bulletproof, what you want to do is expand a thousand X, apply Elon Muskian thinking to your vision, and then attract the people to make that real. Let's try with your company. Tell us your name. My name is Yohan. Yohan, <coughs> from Israel, right? I'm sorry? You're from Israel, right? Born and raised, yeah. I okay, so what does your company do? The beginning or the magnify? Well, let's try the beginning and then magnify it. All right. Well, what my company does is we create, or we, I created a um, social coaching game. A social coaching game. What does that do? What does that contribute to the world? That creates a, um, that creates a couple of things, actually. That creates a, a, a group that's engaged, that uh, engages in a game-like way of um, co-coaching each no, other. No, you're saying what we do. Why, do you, why is this important? Why do you do what, what you do? <laughs> you know, I've been in this space for so long, and I know for a fact that I can, for three to five hundred dollars a year, provide the same value that people pay ten thousand. Value in what? In personal growth. Okay, so what you're basically doing is transforming minds. Transforming yeah. minds through, Not just a, that. So, through, social, through a social game. Yes, okay. and, and I want to change the face of coaching and personal growth. Got it, got it, so that's it. Change the face of coaching and personal growth by using social games, or just change the face of coaching and personal growth. Join our company, change the face of coaching and personal growth, but you gotta go deeper, you gotta say how you're changing the face, right? That can be in the second paragraph or the third paragraph. You can then describe how you're doing it, but you always start with that big why. Thank you. Okay, so, so think about this for your company. So now let's go on to step two. So that's step one. Step one is describe your mission. Now step two, is really interesting. Find the right fit. Once you have the right mission, the next step is to get the right people to join that mission. So there's this famous story about Zig Ziglar, and Zig Ziglar is a brilliant management consultant, and uh, Zig one went to a company. He assembled all the managers together, and he said, guys, I want you to tell me all the qualities of your best people. So he pushed them for three hours and they started tossing out all of the qualities of their best people and he started writing it on a board. Let's try this exercise right now. I want you guys to shout out the qualities of the best people on your team. Go ahead. Innovative, Innovative. passion, dedication. dedication, loyalty, ownership, ownership. ownership. leadership, ownership. service oriented, resourceful, resourceful. Yeah. team player, Creative, okay, let's stop. That's 10 already, okay? So Zig did this, and what he found is that they hit a hundred roughly, a hundred rough, roughly qualities. And he said, no, guys, another hour, let's keep pushing and pushing and pushing on this. And in the next hour, they hit 114. He then took out a mark and he says, okay, folks, we're gonna mark all of these qualities, an A for attitude or an S for skill. Attitude or skill. So he started putting an A or an S next to every quality. Now what they found is that 107 out of 114 were attitudes, and seven out of 114 were skills. Skills meaning good programmer. Skills meaning great graphic designer. Now isn't that interesting? In the qualities that you guys yelled out, I checked 10 out of 10, resourceful, hardworking, innovative, team player, 10 out of 10 were not skills, they were attitudes. Do you guys see the difference? Yet, when we hire people on a job ad, what do we say? What do we ask for? We specify the skills. We, we, we look at people based on their skills. This is one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make. You want to hire for attitude and train for skill. Are you guys clear on this? I've made so many mistakes hiring really skillful assholes. And then, like, seeing them, like, mess up my culture. If you hire the right people, so when faced with two people and one has slightly higher skill, okay, if the one with lower skill has a greater attitude, go for them. Because with the right attitude, they will rapidly be able to catch up on skill. But if they don't have the right attitude, if they don't have the right values, if they don't have the right culture, they will poison your company. Attitude is contagious. And so when you're hiring for attitude, you're actually taking something that 
that is going to go from one person to another to another to another, like like the cold, right? Like the flu. It's contagious. You got to be really careful with this. So you want to seek the best people you can find, but you want to ensure that attitude comes first. Now, in our company. I have this simple mental model. I call it the bar of awesomeness. And every time I'm interviewing someone, I ask them. I ask myself, if I brought this person onto the team, would they raise the bar or would they lower the bar? And even if we really, really, really need a position filled, if they're going to lower the bar, you do not hire them, because as as you'll read about in the book, Good to Great. A players hire A players, but as soon as you lower the bar and you hire a B player, B players hire C players, C players hire D players. The lower they are, the lower they will hire, because if you're not very good at what you do, you're insecure, and you don't want to hire people who are better than you. But when you hire A players, they only want to work with A players. So lowering that bar is crazy dangerous. Laszlo Bock of Google says it this way: Have an incredibly high bar for talent and never compromise. The big mistake I see many entrepreneurs make is that they compromise. They really, 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 really need someone to do that customer support job right away. So this guy maybe doesn't have all the right attitude, but let's let's hire him. Maybe we can change him. Maybe he will shift. Always a mistake. Slow down. Rather than fill a role with the wrong person, slow down. But you must never, ever, ever drop that bar. Yes or yes? Okay. So that's the imaginary bar. Okay. So you you are mentally creating a bar of awesomeness for your company. And doing a gut check with every person you interview, will they raise the overall bar of awesomeness within my company or lower it? Now the next thing I want you to do is to insist that they go beyond the resume. So this is the video cover letter、uh, technique, right? Everybody lies in resumes, guys. I lied on my resume, like my first few jobs. But it's harder to lie on a video. So I asked everyone who's applying to Mind Valley to create a video and to simply answer three questions: Why do I? Three reasons why I want to join Mind Valley. Three reasons why I think I'm awesome. That's it. Now people get really creative with the video. Let me show you a couple of videos that we actually get. Now the beauty of this is, if you don't ask for a video, you get those people who randomly shoot out resumes to every open position and keep their fingers crossed. Right? That's annoying and it so wastes your time. But when you insist on a video, what happens is that you are getting people who care so much about joining you that they are investing sometimes up to a day creating that video. Here's one example of an incredible person we hired. Hi, I'm Tanya Lopez, and this is my video submission for the world's most awesome job. Where are you shooting from? I can see it in your camera. <laughs> I think that this position is a great fit for me for so many different reasons. One of them being that it aligns perfectly with what my professional experience has been so far. I've worked. So Tanya joined Mind Valley, and she ended up helping us working with Laura. She ended up helping us take A Fest into what it is today, right? That's the power of video cover letter. Now, this is another person who joined us, and、um, this one was incredible. She spent 300 man hours creating a hand-drawn animated film to state why she wanted to join the company. Obviously, we hired her for our film team. 300 man hours creating a handmade animated film. She got the job. Right, so you can see you're getting incredibly dedicated people. Now, the math I found looks like this: a hundred resumes equals one video. So when you ask for a video cover letter, you actually are tuning out a hundred resumes, and your life becomes so much easier. So that one video is truly going to be、um, a really exceptional person because they're putting in all of this effort to join your company. So, so that's step number two: ask for a video cover letter. Don't compromise on the bar. And hire for attitude. Video cover letters. The great thing about them is you can really sense someone's attitude in that cover letter. Now we go to step three. Now step three is really interesting. It's called establishing a common code. So, in your company, it's very important that you have a code or a series of values that kind of bring the team together. And the value should be so obvious, so clear that everybody knows them by heart. So the values at Mind Valley. Are very obvious everywhere you look. The first value is unity, and unity simply means appreciating our culture, but seeing ourselves as large as part of a larger planet, a larger Earth. Which is why you notice the attention we pay to Fourth of July, to Canada Day, to cultures all across this room. 
Every time I meet someone, I'm like, "Where are you from?" It's not because I'm trying to isolate you in your culture. It's because I'm truly interested. Because I I love traveling around the world and meeting culture. Unity. Now, the second value is also very easy to see: transformation. We're obsessed with personal growth. Everyone is growing themselves on a regular basis. People come to Mind Valley, and in their first year, they, on average, men lose five kilograms just because of healthy eating, because of WildFit, because of 10x. Right? We're one of those companies where you come, and after one year, you look better, you're dressing better, you're healthier, your cognitive functioning is 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 has gone up because everyone is talking about Bulletproof Coffee or WildFit or Ben Greenfield's longevity tips. And it becomes it becomes just part of the culture. Now the third thing is envisioning. Envisioning is really interesting. It means in anything you do, you are seeking to be the best and to create the boldest vision you can get. Which is why we we innovate very fast. If you look at Mind Value last year, and you look at Mind Value this year, it's a massive growth in terms of the space, in terms of the number of participants. It's because of this value of envisioning. You are. Happy and grateful for what you have accomplished, but you're always thinking, "How can I 10x this?" That's what envisioning means. But here's the funny thing, right? You don't need these three particular values. That's not the point. The point simply is find a set of values. Anywhere from three to seven is a magic number. Now, when we really started digging into these values, we identified around maybe 12, but these three. Were the strongest, so we decided to just limit it to three for now. And here's what you do with the values: you, you, you advertise them everywhere. We created like these superhero artwork,、um, transformation, envisioning. We created this giant sign in our office that says "Unity," and it's it's just there、um, on a high on a wall, like like lit up completely when people come for our weekly meetings. The values are everywhere. Now, why the values are important is that the values speed up decision making. So, let's say, for example, we had so recently, for example, we had to make a decision, and that decision was that:、um, do we want to give our employees two days off so that they could go deep into a retreat called Lifebook that many of you guys have heard of to help them set their goals for their life? Now, it's not cheap. Because we're giving everyone in the company literally two extra days off and paying for them to go to a mountain retreat, to spend a Thursday or Friday, then a Saturday and Sunday on their own, going to their life book. But the decision becomes automatic and easy because it leads to transformation, and transformation is one of the values, right? Another example was we had a customer who was really upset with a product, but but the return date had elapsed. Do we give the customer a refund? Because that might, you know, encourage more customers to get a refund. We're like, yeah, sure. Why not? Because of the value of unity. Unity means you try to see things through another person's eyes. You try to respect a different point of view. We want our customers to be happy because our customers are like a family. Unity. So we give the refund. So values help you speed up decision making. But the cool thing about values is this: when you have these values. And you establish and reaffirm these values over and over and over again. You are basically giving people what religion and church give them. You're giving people a sense of identity, and that identity means they become a deeper part of your company, a deeper part of your mission. They will stay with you longer. So it's really interesting. But human beings, we evolved as such where we need identity. We need to feel part of a tribe. We need to feel part of a larger thing. This is how religions evolves, and religions have their own value system. They have the number of times you pray. They have the fasting month. They have the savior. But when you create these values in a company, you're giving people the same good things that religion gives people, which is a sense of belonging to a shared tribe. And to many individuals, it makes them feel more unified. It makes them feel no longer alone because there are people around them who share these common values. Now, you want to have good values, of course, right? You want to have positive values, not not negative values. They are values that might be counter to cosmocentrism. But as long as you're having good values, you are actually helping elevate people and you are unifying people because tribes have shared values. Does that make sense to you guys? Now the question is, how do you find your values? So, this is the interesting bit. You find your values by looking at your life and identifying your past pain. Your values often come from your past pain that you want no one else to suffer. 
my value of unity came because I was on a fucking watch list and had to leave the country I loved after living there for nine years. That's where unity comes from. That's why Mind Valley, when Trump launched the Muslim watch list, we released a whole ton of videos um, to encourage people to stand up against that, even though we lost some of our customers. We, you don't mess with our value for unity. It's why we want to help. We, it's why we want to help create um, cosmocentrism across the planet. And unity is in every program we do. Every author we bring on Mind Valley right now, we look at the author's work, we look at the author's writing, and we ensure that they have that drive for unity, unity with the planet, unity with the ecology, unity with nations all around the world, right? We are anti-nationalism. That unity drive came from my pain. Why transformation? Because when I was at the lowest point in my life, it was transformation, it was meditation that helped me. Why envisioning? Because I found that we, I, could, I could go from having a small, crappy little office in Kuala Lumpur to Mind Valley by constantly holding in my head a vision of what I wanted to experience in the world. And I wanted to gift that concept of envisioning to everyone who works at Mind Valley. Your values come often from the founder's pain. So if you are founding this company, right, identify what is that pain that you went through that you want nobody else in the world to experience if you could protect them and turn those into your values. Maybe you were abused as a child. And so you decide that your value is compassion. You want to create the most compassionate workplace. Maybe at one point you really wanted to do something you loved, something artistic, something creative, but you were held back by a teacher, by a principal, and you couldn't do that thing that you love. Maybe your value now becomes work that you love, and you ensure that everybody in the company is assigned a task or a job that they truly love. So. It doesn't matter what your values are. There is no magic about unity. There's no magic about transformation or envisioning. All that matters is the agreement on the value. Start somewhere. See, it's not the value itself. It's what the value does. And what the value does is it speeds up decision making and it helps create a tribe of people with shared beliefs. So what we're going to do at this point is, because we've gone into an hour, is you're going to get a break. Okay, and before I give you the break, I'm just going to summarize the first three points of the seven. Create attraction by job ads that appeal to the heart. Find the right fit, hire for attitude and seek the best. And third, establish a code, define your values and live by them. Now, we will, we will come back in around eight minutes, so you have time to use the restroom, get some coffee. But if you want to sit on your chair and you don't need to go, go out there, try identifying at least one of your values if you haven't done it. Go back. What hurt you so bad that you want to save other people from it? Thanks, guys. I'll see you in eight minutes. Everyone, welcome back. So, let's have a seat and let's continue. So, in the last part of this presentation, what we spoke about is the first three steps to creating a truly incredible company culture. And it was create attraction, find the right fit, establish the code. Now, the fun part, we go on to phase two, the next phase. And this is moving from attracting the right people to actually making that culture work, making that culture connect to gel, making it cohesive, really structuring that culture into something that becomes a formidable, like superpower for your organization. And here we come to step four. Now, the beautiful part about this is I already gave you the roadmap. Earlier when I showed you that image of the iPad and I spoke about happiness, growth, meaning and abundance, these are the remaining four elements. Because you see, if this is what people are looking for anyway, give it to them. So the first big thing you want to do is focus on happiness. But I want you to understand that there are some nuances here. I used to call it happiness, but then I realized that I was wrong. It's actually not happiness. It's a subtle difference, and that is it really is about positive optimism. So let me explain the difference, right? You want to create a culture where positive optimism is, is a trait that all your people have. So to understand the difference between happiness and positive optimism, you've got to understand this nuance. Happiness is what you call a state change. So you could be generally happy, but then you could have a death in the family. Or you could just wake up one day and, you know, all of us go through these occasional brain chemical imbalances. I, I get that too. And you just feel 
Like today is one of those dark gray days. And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. It is ridiculous to assume that everybody has to be happy all the time. We all have stuff going on in our brain. We all go through those dark days. But the difference is that it's a state change. You can be happy, you can be sad. You can be happy, you can be sad. You can smoke a joint, you're happy. Next day, recovery, you're sad. It doesn't matter. It's a state change. Now, positive optimism, though, is a stage evolution. Now, a stage evolution is positive optimism is where you as an individual transform to realize that life is ultimately good. And that when something goes wrong, often there's a lesson or there's something you're going to learn from there. Or when something goes wrong, it's just, you know, it's a state change and things are going to shift. You don't dwell into that sadness and turn it into depression. You know that things are going to get better or that there is a meaning or a lesson here. So a state change means that you go in, you go out. You go in, you go out. That's happiness. Positive optimism is a stage evolution. You've evolved to a new stage in your life where you know that there is meaning in what happens, that there might be meaning in what happens, sorry, there might be a lesson in what happens, and that life is ultimately beautiful, life loves you, and that the universe has your back. That is the difference. So it is not the rejection of sadness, but the thought, even during sadness, that the future will be okay. That's a quote, actually, from my wife, Christina. She was talking about positive optimism at AFES. And Christina spoke about the movie, um, gosh, it was a Pixar movie, Inside Out. Inside Out. Do you guys remember the lesson in that movie? I thought it was such a beautiful lesson. In that movie, initially you think that the villain is sadness. Sadness is what's screwing up this girl's life. But later you understand that really sadness isn't the villain. Sadness was a key part of human emotion to help you heal, to help you recover, to help you process things that happen. So watch Inside Out if you haven't already. That movie has a massive transformational effect on people. Brilliant, brilliant work by Disney Pixar. Now, when you can get into a state of positive optimism or happiness, and remember, you don't have to be there all the time, but when you can generate it, you do unlock better abilities to perform. So Sean Aker wrote a, a brilliant book called The Happiness Advantage, and what he says in that book is, it turns out our brains are literally hardwired to perform at their best, not when they are negative or even neutral, but when they are positive. And he gives science study after science study after science study. For example, optimistic salespeople outsell pessimists by 55%. Students primed to be happy outperform their neutral peers. Doctors make accurate diagnoses 19% more often when they are primed to be happy. And you know how these Harvard scientists prime these doctors to be happy? Before sending the doctor to see a patient, they simply gaffed the doctor a lollipop. That's it. They flipped it. They gaffed the doctor a lollipop. The lo doctor's like, what is this? He unwrapped the wrapper, sucked in it, and their brains were now making 19% better diagnoses. It shows that even something as tiny as a weird little lollipop can change the way you perform. So what truly makes us happy, right? There was another study by Harvard, by Ed Diener, and he found that the one thing that truly makes us happy is the strength of our social connections. 0.7 correlation to happiness. So what you want to do is to create social connections. That is the, the statement from the study. Social support was a far greater predictor of happiness than any other factor. Martin Seligman and Ed Diener, it was called a very happy people study. Nothing makes us happier than social support. This means having people around you who care about you, having community, having joint families, having healthy relationships, having co-workers that you can call your friends. So social support creates happiness. Happiness is that rocket fuel to productivity and to hitting your goals. That is how the math works. So how do you do this? How do you engineer happiness in a company? See, for the longest time, we thought that happiness was just fluff, but it isn't. It turns out that when you can engineer happiness into a company, these companies perform better. So one of the things that we do at Mindvalley is we, we really ensure that our people have a great social life. Tons of parties, opportunities to attend AFES or Mindvalley U. We do something called a team retreat, and we invest a lot of money into this, almost a quarter million dollars. We fly our entire team to a beach site, um, location where they can bond, where they can connect. Sometimes we might like rent out 80% of an entire airplane, check out that photo, right? The people in that picture who are not smiling are the ones who don't work for us. <laughs> and then we take this happiness and we deliver it to our clients. Our biggest clients, by the way, 
are actually our teachers. We know if we make our teachers happy, they make the students happy. So these are our teachers. You'll recognize Lisa Nichols, you'll recognize Emily Fletcher, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dave Asprey. And look, they're all dressed in togas. This is a giant toga party for our biggest clients. So that weirdness, these, these, these engineered events help create connection and happiness. In Good to Great by Jim Collins, Jim said this, the people we interviewed from good to great companies clearly loved what they did, largely because they loved who they did it with. So what's going on is when you're creating these social connections to engineer happiness, you basically are making people love their job. And then there was this study, right, by Gallup, which I thought was insane. I couldn't believe these numbers, but Gallup says so. Gallup found that close work friendship boosts employee satisfaction by 50%, and people with a best friend at work are seven times more likely to engage fully in their work. Seven times more likely. So, basically, you want to encourage friendship at work. And, you know, there's this, this dumb myth that says you don't, you don't merge your work life and your personal life. That is garbage, folks. You want to merge your work life and personal life. You want to encourage friends at work. You want to be close to your coworkers. As Gallup says, satisfaction by employees goes up 50%, engagement 700%. So this is why the social parties, this is why the, 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 um, the team retreats are important. Now I'm gonna teach you a couple of ways to engineer this. So that's one, create friendships at work. Now, idea number two, is positive contagions. You want to form deliberate positive contagions. This means that you actually create a situation that is almost like a celebration, and that creates a positive contagion that infects everyone in the company. So here's the science. Studies have found that when leaders are in a positive mood, their employees are more likely to be in a positive mood themselves, to exhibit pro-social behavior, helping others, and to coordinate tasks more efficiently and with less effort. If the leader is in a positive mood, employees are operating better. So you create positive mood by actually injecting contagions into your company. Now, one of the contagions we inject is called culture days. So can you guys guess what culture day that is? That's Estonian culture day. Everybody comes dressed in blue, black, and white. We have a wife carrying competition. Christina and a bunch of other Estonians in our office organize it. And then there's an Estonian quiz, and the winner of the Estonian quiz gets a free flight to Estonia. That's an Estonian culture day. We also have a Malaysian culture day, which is all around food, because that's a big part of Malaysian culture. That's an Indian culture day, where every woman in the company, around 80 of them, dress up in saris and Indian outfits. Um, the US culture day, where we drink from a red cup, um, have the best Budweiser money can buy, and eat hot dogs. And, and, and what's going on? What's going on over here? What, what's going on over here is that we are creating these culture days every two weeks. Every two weeks on a Thursday, we celebrate a culture. Now, what's going on during a culture day is we're actually carving away two hours of work output. We're, that's being disrupted. So if a regular work day is eight hours, on a culture day, you're only getting six hours of work, but that's cool. What happens is that two hours of fun and play that's injected in the company create a ripple effect. People connect with their, with, with, with their teammates. People um, start getting greater trust with their manager because what happens, is, and then that compensates for the two hours that is being disrupted every two weeks which is around one hour a week. So literally, one hour a week at Mind Valley is dedicated to fun and play. And this creates these social cohesions that carry the company forward. So here's a study by Segal Bassad, which I found really interesting. It's called The Ripple Effect, Emotional Contagion and Its Effects. Positive people improve team members' performance, group performance, reduce group conflict, create more cooperation, and greater overall performance for task at hand. What Segal Basad did is that they would have team meetings, right? And in these studies, there would be regular teams, and then there would be certain teams where they would deliberately inject a positive person. Now, the positive person doesn't mean he's the guy there, like, cracking jokes and stuff. Just an overall positive person who would walk in, would maybe, you know, compliment someone on what they are wearing, would maybe ask if anybody else wants some coffee and then go and bring the coffee, would maybe um, be smiling, have a good, beautiful smile on their face, and just having that person in a meeting boosted the overall output and efficiency of the meeting. 
So when you're creating these culture days, what you're doing is you're creating these positive eruptions. And so yes, you are carving out. You are wasting some time where people could be back at their spreadsheets, but. That positivity stays with the team. It creates a ripple effect, and it helps elevate other employees. And over the long term, you create greater loyalty. You get greater engagement. You create people who are more passionate about their job. Now, maybe you don't have the diverse amount of cultures that Mind Valley has. It doesn't matter what you celebrate. You can make up your own culture day. This is one culture day we once made up. It was called Tash and Heels Day. For 30 days, every guy in Movember. Spent 30 days growing a mustache, right? We all look like absolute idiots. And then on one day, we all showed up to work with our mustaches, and the woman just showed up in heels. It was called Tash and Heels Day. And then we had a photographer take photos of us. It was just stupid. It was funny, but it causes people to connect. Now here, though, is the best idea. It's called Love Week. It's about infusing love into the workplace. How many of you here now do Love Week at your companies? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, wow, you guys are really behind. We're going to fix this. So, Love Week is a practice we do on the week of Valentine's Day every single year. What happened was, sometime in 2011, a group of people in Mind Valley who were single, I saw them around a coffee table bitching about being single and you know, feeling like shit on Valentine's Day. So, so someone came up with an idea: Why don't we just be like secret angels for each other, and you know, like bring flowers or chocolates to each other in secret? So the singles did it. And it was so much fun. The people in relationships are like,、um, "Can I get in too?" And then now the people who are in relationships got in it, and it became this thing called Love Week. So what happens is that during the entire week on which Valentine's Day is falling, from Monday to Friday, so everyone in the company the week before draws a name from a hat. And let's say you pick a name from a hat. You now, for the next five days, are going to be that person's secret angel. Without letting them know who you are, you're going to deliver notes of appreciation, flowers, maybe chocolates, maybe you know. Buy them lunch, but you cannot reveal who you are. You have to rope in other employees to be the de- the delivery person. Now, a beautiful thing happens when you do this. You are actually surprising someone. You're making people feel appreciated, feel good. But because you're roping in other employees, you're creating really good social connections, right? In one occasion,、um, the woman who was getting the flowers fell in love with the delivery person. So it's really interesting. So it's like three or four people who are now being roped in. Now it's so. Interesting to 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 witness that we put up a web page where you can go and learn about the practice and bring it to your company. It's all free,、um, but I want to play for you this video. This is a two-minute video hosted by Talia, who's running our programming here at Mind Valley, that shows you what happens at Love Week. So check this out. So we have this tradition at Mind Valley. It's called Love Week. It's super cute. This is what people do, right? So you are an angel, and everyone has a human, and for the whole week we just love on this human. We give them fruit platters, and it's all a surprise, and chocolates, and really funny notes, and pens, and we buy them lunch, and they have no idea. So what happens is we get stuck in the bit of a love loop. It's like there's love coming from here, and then there's love going there, and it's just love, 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 love. Love Week is all about connection. It's about giving and being open to receiving. It's about bringing depth to the workplace and about caring and sharing. Right? Thanks, bro. Look, it's business as usual, right? Like every other day of the week, we love here at Mind Valley. It's in our culture to hug and to kiss and to stare at each other. But we've gone on overload this week. It's like with love. One of the really beautiful and naturally occurring elements of Love Week is all the surprises. You just never know when you're going to be ambushed with love. <laughs> and there are four. Oh, there are several of them.、So. <laughs> People get really creative, and they think, "How can I best express my love?" For this person, what can I do? I can go on Facebook, see what they're into, what's their favorite color, what's their favorite food. So it's like Sebastian, for example. He loves guacamole, and I just saw his angel delivered him guacamole, and he's like, <gasps> guacamole, like his day is made. And why can't we do this every day? I don't know. But the thing is, for this one week, we just go on overload, and it's the most beautiful thing. So this is one tradition that we have here at Mind Valley.
<laughs> so the great thing about Love Week is it's about appreciation in the workplace. And studies show that when people feel close to each other, when they appreciate each other, productivity goes through the roof. So every company should be doing this. Anastasia, happy Thank Love Week. Thank you so much. <laughs> As the Persian poet Rumi once said, love is the bridge between you and everything. So we invite you, go and be the bridge, go forth and spread this radical social movement with your friends and family and your workplace. So thank you, Talia, for that, that amazing. Mind Valley. Here. Am I? Is it on? So it happens every year during Valentine's Day. Now, this is a really interesting thing. Did something happen to my mic? Okay. One, two. Okay, thank you, Luke. So, there's a very interesting scientific study that shows why Love Week actually can really, really, really boost your, your career if you engage in it, right? So, Harvard did this study and they, they studied this thing called social connectivity score. And they found that in any company, if you have high social connectivity score, if you're in the top 25% of people with high social connectivity score, you have, a, you have a advantage. Now, here's what social connectivity score means. You are rated high in social connectivity score if your employees are saying that you're kind, that you're helpful, that you're appreciative, that you're the guy who, or girl who is often in a positive mood, who might, you know, go and ask someone if you can bring them coffee because you're running down to the cafe anyway, that's high social connectivity score. Now what they found is that you, if you score in the top quartile, that means the top 25% in your company for social connectivity, you are 40% more likely to receive a promotion or raise in the next two year period of time. 40% more likely. So really, you're not doing this because you love your coworkers, you're doing this for your damn wallet. But either way, it works, right? So. Of course, I'm kidding there, but there's a massive advantage to, to being in that high social connectivity score. Now, the next idea for happiness, and this is something I feel very strongly about. Many companies don't do that because they believe in being frugal, but you want to invest in your environment. People need a beautiful space to, to work from. Luke, who's been hosting today, he's actually in charge of our Mind Valley spaces. So he works with designers and architects to make sure that all our places look absolutely beautiful. Now, I want to share this word of advice to entrepreneurs in the room. So in 2008, all of a sudden, when Mind Valley started making, becoming successful, I remember, you know, I was sitting around with my business partner who was a guy, who was a man, and like guys, many guys know. Soon as you start making money, one of the first thing that goes in your head is, oh my God, I'm going to buy that car I always wanted. I'm going to buy that Porsche, that Lamborghini, finally. But as we were talking about that for a while, me, me and my business partner at that time were actually pretty serious about getting ourselves like, you know, a, a nice car. But then we realized how stupid that was. Because why buy a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or any other type of car if your business makes a sudden landfall? I mean, it's nothing more to compensate for, you know, Many people will justify that. I've heard men say, hey, no, 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 if I have that fancy car, the clients I go to visit are gonna take me more seriously. But my argument is this, that's social conditioning. That's these big luxury car companies telling you that you need that expensive vehicle to compensate for something. What instead you might wanna do is take that money that you're gonna put in the car and invest it in your office. Because here's what happens. Now, everyone gains all the people who work in that company gain from that upgrade of the office. And you still get the benefit of being able to impress the client. You still get the benefit of being able to impress those people you need to visit on business meetings. So for the longest time, I drove a really shitty car. I drove a Nissan March, but I had an incredible office. And I wouldn't use my car to impress people, because just, that just benefits me. 
I would use the office to impress the client, the office to impress the press. So that's a really important thing. Guys, don't waste your money on bullshit vehicles to compensate for whatever inadequacy you have. Put it in your office and invest in your employees. Cool? So, summary, happiness, social support, create opportunities for connection, positive contagion, spread good moods, invest in your environment. Now we come to growth. Growth is a big one. When we were, you know, when I asked Riddit there, what do you, what most appeals to you? He, like many other people of his age, say growth. Especially if you're talking to millennial employees, they care about growth a lot because they know that at that particular era of their life, growth is what is gonna fuel their success and happiness further on. So growth looks like this. Now many companies get this wrong, and I got this wrong when I first started. When I first got into positions of management or leadership, this was my favorite quote on leadership. Leadership is getting other people to do things you want done because they want to do it. It's by Dwight Eisenhower. And I thought, man, Eisenhower, amazing leader, and he was for his era. But today, that kind of leadership is the kind of leadership that could make you mobilize a million men to fight a dumb, useless war. It doesn't apply in today's world. So what we felt was a better way of leadership, and we documented this as what we call the Mind Valley Management philosophy, is this. Leadership is recognizing that we are all one, that every person you lead is as brilliant as you, as talented as you, and has the same capacity for growth and accomplishment. They simply need to be reminded of this fact. Now, when you read that, what does it sound like? Coaching, right? It sounds like what we are saying is leaders are the best coach. Now, we came up with this in 2010, 2011. There was no scientific data for it. It was just what we felt. But this past year, Google re released a study. And Google wanted to identify what were the qualities of their best employees. And they thought it was going to be STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. Turned out, the quality of the best employees at Google is coaching. They were the best coaches. So now I can say that there's actually scientific studies on this. If you want to be a great leader, you need to be able to create great leaders. Yes or yes? Okay, so here's one of the ways that you can fuel growth in your company. You help your employees establish their personal vision. We once had the luxury of having Bill Jensen, the author of Hacking Work and Future Work, come and speak at our office. And I pulled Bill after his speech aside and I asked him, Bill, you know, what's the future of work? And he said this, the future of work is not just about getting employees engaged with a company's vision. Future work will be about being engaged with an employee's vision. Now, how do we do this? Well, guys, I've given you the methodology. It's called the three most important questions. Do you guys remember this exercise from two days ago? So it's about teaching them the difference between a means goal and an end goal. Having people do the exercise to identify their experiences, how they want to grow, how they want to contribute, letting them see how each connects to the other. And then when they are done, celebrating that. Now what we do with these sheets of paper, so here this is one that we did for, um, for Vina, who was actually a speaker at Mind Valley U um, last year. You can see her experiences, her growth, her contribution. You can see she wrote down things such as, I want to visit Spain, I want to visit Argentina, I want to read 12 different books a year. And then we as a company support each other with this. So that's the really cool part. Now, this is an example, okay? This was a, a woman called Luminita who was working in customer support at Mind Valley, and she wrote this down. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. So I shared with you a couple of examples of how these things seem to cause magic to manifest. Lumina wrote down she wanted to be a world-class photographer, she wanted, to be, um, she wanted to travel internationally, she wanted to be a um, writer, and, and we supported her. For example, because she wanted to be a world-class photographer, on one particular AFES, when we needed extra hands with photography, we hired her to come and take photographs. So we helped her with her dream. But something really funny happens when you do this exercise. In her case, she ended up writing an article called 15 Things to Give Up to Be Happy. She was maintaining a personal blog while, while working for Mind Valley. And for the first six months, nothing happened to the article. Then all of a sudden, people started sharing it, and you'll see up there, it got 1.2 million likes on Facebook it became the most viral personal growth post in the history of Facebook. And next thing you know, she got a book deal from Penguin. So she got paid to write a book. She became a published author. What she wrote down happened. Now, of course, she left the company, but that's okay with us. 
That's absolutely okay with us because when people hear that story of Luminita, what do you think happens? They join Mind Valley, and we started getting a flood of applications from Romania, where she's from, because guess who she asked to write the forward for that book? Me. So these things come back to you. It's like good karma. Now here's another example. This is Amer Ahmad. Okay. Amir Ahmad Nasser joined Mind Valley at 22 when he did his three most important questions. He, he came from Sudan and he wrote that he wanted to speak at Ivy League universities. He wanted to be a published author. He was going to be in the newspapers. He was going to be a leading world authority. At 26, he wrote a book called My Islam, How Fundamentalism Stole My Mind and Doubt Freed My Soul. The book got picked up by Foreign Policy magazine and was declared one of the must-read books of 2013. He was 26 years old. Next thing you know, he's speaking at Google's New York campus. He's speaking at the Oslo Freedom Summit. He's traveling to DC, staying at the, at the house of the editor of the Washington Post. He's not even 30 yet. All of it manifested. And the crazy thing is, Amir's new book is coming out. Um, he told me I, I can't say the title, but that new book teaches you, and, and it was through Amir that I learned that process I shared with you just an hour ago on how to find your values by identifying your pain. Do you guys remember that? That came from him. So my intern at 22 became my teacher. So again, when you can take people and turn them into the best versions of themselves, they give back to you. There's this beautiful karmic cycle there. And yes, they may fly away. They may go and start their next career or start their next company. But stories happen. And those stories will bring you even more brilliant people. Now, what you want to do when you do this exercise is take all of the three MIQs and stick it on a giant board and let everybody see what everyone else is doing and let them collaborate. You want to let managers treat this as a blueprint into the soul of everyone that they lead. Because now, a manager will have a lunch with someone and they will have their three MIQ and they will know what truly drives this person. Now, another example, these were four people, including Ezekiel, who's a CHRO, he's here at Mind Valley U. He went and found three other people who had written on their 3MIQ that they wanted to hike the Himalayas. And all four of them organized a Himalayan hike together. Now that is fantastic for company morale. It's fantastic for teamwork. So by taking the 3MIQs, making everyone in the company do it, and then making it public, you actually create a culture full of support where everyone is helping each other grow. And that's one of the greatest gifts you can give your people. Now again, if you, if you need to run this in your company, we've made it free. Go to Extraordinary by Design on the, uh, on the app, the Quest app, click on Discover. You can see Extraordinary by Design over there. Just go ahead and click on it, enroll, and you will have the full 3MIQ uh, as a Quest, and you can take your employees through it. And in, in that particular quest, we break down experiences, growth, and contribution deeper into the, um, these, these categories. So again, just get it from there, completely free. Those of you who might want to take it further, you might want to consider bringing Lifebook to your company. We now have that. So we're now taking John Butcher's Lifebook and making it a corporate program, and we're bringing this to companies around the world. Everybody who joins Mind Valley, that's one of our recent Lifebook classes. We send them to the mountains, to a beautiful resort for four days to complete their Lifebook. Four days fully paid for our employees to plan their entire life, their entire life and how they want to grow. And then if we can help support that growth in any way, we make it happen. So summary, growth, okay? Have them do the three MIQ, experiences, growth, contribution. And um, next we go on to meaning. So meaning is really, really interesting. You want to infuse meaning into everything you do. I put that picture up there with this slide because that's Cardi and Miriam who have been for the last year or so helping plan Mind Valley U. And let me tell you, Mind Valley U is no easy task. Last year when I did it, it almost broke me. I happened to end up in the hospital because of the sheer amount of stress organizing it for 300 people. They, along with the rest of the team, are doing it for a thousand people. But one of the things that helps fuel people to be able to take on such massive projects is the meaning. I speak to Miriam, I speak to Cardi, and I know why they do this, because they see you guys, they hear your feedback, they see children and adults changed, and they see that transformation, and that gives them superpowers to pull off something as difficult and, and almost sometimes near impossible. I mean, to bring a thousand people to a city and plan 
30 days of activities sounds insane, but they do it for the meaning. So what you got to understand is that human beings are goal-driven organisms. We, unlike any other animal, are driven and designed to chase a goal. That goal in the hunter-gatherer days might have been a bison or a deer. Today, it's often our work, but that same thing is hardwired within us. We're no longer hunting for berries or trying to kill a bison. We are in our brains, seeking to create things, to accomplish a goal. The goal could be running a marathon, but the goal could also be building a great app or building a great product. You want to give people goals. You want to give people meaningful events that they can pursue because this makes them happier at their work. So I shared with you that quote that I asked Branson, but I didn't share with you the last line. And the last line was this. Let me read the full quote. It's about finding and hiring people smarter than you, getting them to join your business and giving them good work, then getting out of the way and trusting them. You have to get out of the way so you can focus on the bigger vision. That's important. And here's the main thing. You must make them see their work as a mission. What is the mission for your company? So there are a couple of ways you can design a mission, and we played with that earlier when I called up two of you on stage. Thank you for coming up on stage and showing how you can take what you do and turn it into why you do it. Another great way to think about your mission is something called the MTP, the Massive Transformational Purpose. This comes from a book called Exponential Organizations by Salim Ismail. Brilliant book. Go ahead and read it. The MTP is the Massive Transformational Purpose that your company wants to, to bring forth into the world. See, the problem with most people is that their problems aren't big enough. The problem with most people is that they're worried about that guy or girl who didn't text them back, or they're worried about, you know, what, how are they going to go out for that social activity and still catch Game of Thrones? But what happens when you create the right culture is that you're giving people bigger things to worry about, giving people massive problems for them to fix. And human beings are hardwired for that. So when you tell people, look, I want you to join my organization because what we want to do is help accelerate science and technology research. Or what we want to do is help transform people using social gamification. You're giving them bigger problems for them to solve. And people want this. You're doing them an incredible favor because we are fulfilled when our life has meaning. And our life has meaning when we are trying to do good for the world. So what problem are you trying to solve with your company? This should be what you speak about at every company meeting. This should be what is on your literature. This should be what is on your career website more than anything else. And I shared with you the Elon Musk example. So in our management team, we call it, we, we, we call it, Musk, we, we call it the Muskian goal. What is that way of taking what your company does and Elon Muskifying it so it's so much bigger than you can imagine? And give yourself 10, 20 years. We're giving ourselves 20 years to transform education globally. But by playing at that level and speaking at that level, you attract people who are crazy enough to want to join you and do it with you. That's why this is so important. Now, there's some signs for this, as usual. 1958 Gallup study on men who retire at 80. 86% kept working because they found their work fun. But 93% said they kept working because they found their work meaningful. Okay, now, let's refine this idea of meaning. So, you can take on a massive problem. But what if your company, what if your company today maybe isn't doing something that is world-changing, right? Maybe, you are, maybe you're selling t-shirts, and that's okay. T-shirts make people happy. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to keep us from being naked. But how do you make that and turn that into meaning? Now, here's another element that you can bring in, and we have started doing this at Mind Valley, and it has accelerated innovation. We call it visionary leadership. Now, visionary leadership can be defined in many ways. But what it means is leading by vision. You see, many people put managers in charge of teams. And I had done that as well. It was the wrong thing to do. When you put managers in charge of teams, what happens is that it becomes about the operational, the operations of the team. 
and it becomes about management and, and KPIs, and all of that is important. But when you put leaders in charge of teams, a visionary leader, you actually supercharge that team. Now here is how it's phrased out in a, in a beautiful book. The book, is, um, the book is called How You Do Anything Is How You Do Everything. And it's called Envisioning the Future Disposition. Having a leadership disposition means mentally envisioning a better future for yourself, the task at hand, and for those whom you labor. Leadership starts with vision, and leaders envision every moment. You could envision a feature in a technological platform, or envision a whole new product, or simply envision a way to make someone else's day a little better. You can create the new vision, or embrace someone else's and make it your own. But it's about envisioning that future. If you don't have a vision, then you will fall outside the lens of how, and you are a short-term manager, task-oriented, obedient and obsessed with and limited to what you can see right under your nose. Short-term managers tend to be reactive by nature and find themselves putting out fires more often than they light the beacons that show the way. It is a defensive posture and worries more about appeasing others than about engaging them. This was the biggest lesson I learned in the last one year. So we got rid of managers. Three months ago, even on our technology team, we basically, we used to have project managers guiding our programmers. And we said, we can't do this anymore. So we took the project management, we said, in some cases, we're gonna ask you guys to leave. In some cases, we're gonna put you guys to simply support the programmers. But our programmers were going to be part of the vision. Our programmers were gonna decide what features to build. And when we did that, the pace of a technological development increased by almost 10x. We just sped up innovation. We sped up technology. People came to me and said they were more excited about their job because we were now le having visionary leaders guide the team rather than managers. In every division of your company, you want to make sure the leader of the team is not the manager. And I cannot stress this enough. The leader of the team is the one who is thinking about how to make that team best in the world, how to create the best learning app, how to create the best customer support. And they are focused on that product, that vision. This is a very, very, very important thing. Now, when you design companies like that, you basically supercharge innovation. So there's a brilliant book right out right now called Powerful by Patty McCord. Patty McCord is the woman who helped Reed Hastings create the Netflix culture deck. And one of the things Patty says is that this whole thing about empowering people is bullshit. Your people don't need to be empowered. Your people are powerful. They are powerful as soon as they walk in through the door. What you need to do is give them a channel to use this power. Most companies don't do that. Most companies say, okay, you're on a customer support team, great. Your job is to answer emails from nine to five, and we're gonna measure you in the number of emails that you answer. That's okay, but what if you applied visionary leadership to that? You said, guys, our job is in one year to be the best customer support team in the world. I don't care how you do it, I'm sure you guys are gonna figure it out, but in addition to answering your emails, let's figure out how we can innovate on customer support, how we can be the best customer support team in the world. Let's open up a blog where we can share our best practices with other customer support teams. That, by the way, is how the Mind Valley customer support team ended up being um, rated number one customer support in Asia by Nice Reply. Because in February of 2011, I set that vision to Luba, who was then running the team. And then for the next three years, they kept hacking away and moving towards that vision. So everything we do at Mind Valley now, every single team needs to seek to apply visionary leadership to challenge the status quo. And Steve Jobs says, great people don't need to be managed. If you have a vision, great people will self-manage because great people, they don't want to be managed. They don't want to be micromanaged. They don't want to worry about like, like, you know, who's approving their leaves. They just want to do epic shit. Am I right? And that's what you want. So how do you be an inspiring leader? So here's a couple of things. Sri Kumar Rao, who's one of our Mind Valley uh, authors, says this, don't try to be inspiring. You don't, your job isn't to be inspiring. Your job is to be inspired. And this means inspired by what you can build, inspired by what you can bring forth into the world, inspired by a cause you can help. And you could be at any level of organization, and you can be a great leader 
by being inspired. Here's one example, and some of you may have read this story. This was the dry cleaner who, during the 2008 recession, put up that, that sign on his door that said, if you are unemployed and need an outfit cleaned for an interview, we will clean it for free. My God, that dry cleaner's business blew up. He was all over the media. He was inspired to help people, right? To help people who had been laid off. But by being inspired, he became an inspiration to millions of Americans during the recession to become more supportive of each other. So the other way you want to think about this is to make everybody in your team seek to be the best. Now, there's a caveat here. They are not seeking to compete with each other. They are seeking to be the best possible person they can be at their job. If you have someone in charge of Facebook advertising, their job. So in, in Mind Valley, this is actually the conversations we have. The first thing I tell them is, how soon before Facebook makes you a case study? So we once had a situation where we had a Google advertising team, and we were having a massive issue with Google AdWords. So what was going on is that Google was changing the rules very fast, and um, we would put up an ad for meditation, and then the rules would change and the ad was no longer allowed, because Google was not focused on small businesses. Google makes most of its money from the BMWs of the world, so they made the, um, the, the, the art of advertising on Google really complex, uh, because they didn't really care about the smaller businesses. So we were being, back then it was called the Google slap. We as a small business were seeing our ads be taken down from Google over and over and over and over and over again. The rules were changing so fast. And for one year, the manager of the team was putting um, um, every two weeks or so a calendar item, how to avoid the Google slap, how to avoid the Google slap, how to avoid the Google slap. After six months, I went to that manager, I'm like, I'm not showing up to a meeting anymore on how to avoid the Google slap, right? I want you to change that calendar item to how to be a Google case study. That was it. How to be a Google case study. In three months, Google was in our office filming our team. We were a Google case study. Three months. That's how powerful you can manifest. But you've got to flip that. Visionary leadership actually taps into some wicked, weird, magical aspect of the soul, of maya or reality, and makes these visions come to you faster. But if you're nothing more than a petty manager, you're so focused on the problems of the now that those visions will not come true. This is why you want to shift from focused on the problems of the now, management in other words, to visionary leadership. Yes or yes? Okay, now, how do you keep people reminded of this? So we, we do it, this thing called mission reminders, right? And it means repeat, repeat, repeat the vision. Every time we have a company meeting, I'm there on stage repeating Valley's vision. And many management books say this, if your employees are not going, oh my God, there he goes again talking about the damn mission, I've heard this 256 times already, then you're not doing it right. You must be as annoying as the child at the back of the car going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You want to keep repeat, repeat, repeating the vision. So, you know, a couple of things we do. We have a blog called Customer Love where we share all our stories of our customers. You'll notice Martha over here, Martha V, who's filming you guys uh, for customer stories. And a lot of these go up on our blog. And, you know, these stories are not for our customers. In fact, the reason we maintain this blog is because I want these stories seen by our people. So we scour the web for stories of how Mind Valley is changing lives. Sometimes some of you guys might send us a card. In this case, an 11-year-old girl sent us this beautiful bracelet. Boom, it goes on our office wall. We want to remind people of how they acting on the mission is changing the world. See, it's not for our employees, it's for our customers. So here's what you want to do. You want to ensure that meaning is a key part of your company. Now, there's one final part, right? So we now have covered, let's see, three, six. We're now at point number seven. How are you guys doing so far? So let's go on to abundance, the final bit. So I would like to keep it simple and just call this abundance. And for the longest time, I did. But then we realized that abundance really wasn't it. People were not joining the company for abundance, at least they thought when they did the interview, but really what people were seeking was the end goal. Abundance is the means goal. What we really want, why we really want abundance is for something else. And that something else is significance. So we switch abundance to significance. How can you make people feel significant? Now, a great salary is part of that. 
I recommend that all companies pay at least 10% above market rates. But that's easy to do. You can go back and do that immediately. What is harder to do is to make people feel significant. And I think all of us, there's this part of us where we need to know that our lives matter. We need to know that because we live, the world is better. We need to know that we are significant in some way. And so a key part of what you do is to engineer significance. And here's how you do it. The first thing, and by the way, guys, when I read the science behind this, it blew me away. It's frequent appreciation. Now, Richard Branson said, like flowers flourish on water, people flourish on praise. And Richard's an amazing guy, but he's very intuitive in, in terms of, of his understandings of management. So yes, this is true, but what's the hardcore science? I wanna share with you the hardcore science especially the hardcore science between, behind this specific ritual. It's called the two-minute appreciation. And when you listen to Sean Aker describe this, so Sean Aker is the famous Harvard psychologist on happiness. I interviewed him on Skype. Listen carefully to this story, because if you're like me, this will freaking blow your mind. It's called the two-minute appreciation. And guys, thus far, I've given you almost 20 different things you can bring to your business. This is the second most important. So if there's one or two things you do, this is it. Happiness may be a choice, but it requires some effort on our part. And I think it requires effort both at the individual level, but also I think for those of us that, that own companies, those of us that lead other people, I think that we have um, not just a, a moral obligation, but a business obligation to make sure that the people on our team are in a positive state. Um, I think at the individual level, one of the things we found huge success with is uh, we started having individuals uh, each day. At, we'd, the managers oftentimes would lead this, um, but what we'd have people do at Facebook, what we had people do at Nationwide Insurance in the U.S., we had them every morning when they got into work, the very first task they had to do for 21 days in a row was to write a single two-minute positive email praising or thanking one person that they know. Simple two-minute positive email. So it could be something as simple as, thank you so much for helping me with my work yesterday, or it could be something meaningful like, you're the reason why I come into work each day, you're my best friend here. Or it could be, you know, thank you so much for covering for me when I had so much work going on the other day. But in each one of those moments, uh, what that person is doing is they're actually becoming, uh, they're providing praise to somebody else. Um, and if they do it for three days in a row, they get addicted to it because they think how amazing they are for writing that email each morning. But the real value, and people start writing emails back about how grateful that they are to that person. But the real value is 21 days later, if we come back in and test the group that does it, if somebody did it for 21 days in a row, it turns out that their social connection score is in the top quartile of social connection. So a simple two minute habit each day, move them exactly where people wanted them to be within these studies, which leads to not only levels of happiness, but promotion, productive energy, sales, all the things, every business outcome we know how to test for. So we did this in Nationwide Insurance. We were working with a uh, the president of Nationwide Brokerage Solutions, Gary Baker, who said he was a numbers guy. And he said, you know, uh, I thought happiness research was fluff, you know, until we showed him the numbers and what we've been doing at these organizations. So he allowed us to do this intervention with his team. We did a couple interventions, but they think that this was the most powerful one. Over the next 18 months, they had a 50% rise in their revenue, which is crazy. 237% increase. Yeah, right. That's the incredible part. 237% increase in their application rates. Google flew out to see what they were doing. Their pharmaceutical company client came out to see how they're running their call centers. Um, they started taking people off of their phones each day for 10 minutes so that they could actually have an opportunity to praise one another, to check in on the success that somebody else had had and switch the leader each day. They called them huddles. Um, turns out that they've had such, they went from 650 million to 950 million in a single year um, with no new hires at that point, which was phenomenal. Isn't that incredible? That's three, 600 and, 650 650 million to 950 million in a single year with no new hires. That's the power of appreciation. And all, if you guys didn't catch that, all that they were getting the managers to do was to start their day setting their iPhone aside for two minutes and writing a letter of appreciation. So you can do this in any way. I, I don't like using email, so I do it on WhatsApp. So for example, uh, just as an example, when Luke was giving his morning talk, I was at the back listening to him and I sent him a little WhatsApp message just you know, telling him how inspired I was by what he shared. 
two-minute appreciation. But those things make a massive impact on your organizational culture. It's one of the most amazing things you can do. So if that was one of the most amazing things, what's the, what's the one that I say is the number one, right? This is it. It's called the unexpected gift. So the two-minute appreciation is the second most powerful technique you can bring in. I believe this is the most powerful, but this requires a little bit more work, a little bit more than two minutes. So I want to stress, this is the single most powerful idea here. If you can do this, amazing. Now, I mentioned the three most important questions, and I mentioned that you have everyone in the company share it. Now, what you want to do is to, if you're a manager or supervisor, or if you're the company founder, take a picture on your iPhone of everybody's three most important questions. So I do that. And the next time you're in a bookstore, just see how you can support them. So this is the 3MIQ of one person on my team who does customer support. And I noticed that right up there she wrote, she wants to live in Italy for a year. So I was in the bookstore and I picked up this book for her, Lonely Planet Italy. And then in the book, I simply wrote a message along these lines. Dear so-and-so, I saw in your three most important questions that you wanted to spend a year in Italy. I hope that when this dream manifests, this book comes in handy. That's it. That simple thing. Now, what I've found is that when you do this for people, it completely changes their relationship with you and the company. It, it, it changes everything. What I'm asking you to do is to believe in people before they can believe in themselves. By giving them that little token, you're basically saying, look, I believe in you. I so believe in you that you're going to achieve this goal that I bought you this book to help you along the way. And this creates this incredible pattern interrupt in people's heads because this is what is going on in the minds of people who work for companies. Firstly, everyone is slightly nervous and scared of their boss, right? And everyone, all of us, including me, we have our insecurities. So imagine that you're giving feedback as a manager to one of the writers on your team and you go, this article, this article can't release it. There's no way. How long did you work on it? Two days? I'm sorry, but ah, uh, can't release it. Now, in that person's mind, they're going, oh, shit, I'm a failure. I failed my boss. I failed my manager. God, I, 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 I'm not going to be able to look them in the eye because all of us have these self-esteem issues. But when you do that gift, when you give that gift, you've basically flipped the switch. You've made them realize that you as a manager actually care about them. You as a manager actually believe in them. And now they start seeing that incident from a different lens. They go, oh, okay, my manager really believes in me. It's just that this article wasn't up to my capabilities. I'm gonna you know, study the techniques, maybe get some advice from my manager and try again and improve. It becomes not about them, it becomes about their work. And them is a statement on them, but their work simply means, oh great, I can optimize that work. I can learn, I can hack that article. I can study new ways of writing. And they approach it differently. So all of a sudden, you create a culture where radical candor is easy. You see, a lot of books talk about radical candor. Be honest, be upfront, but if you don't first establish compassion and that you care, radical candor can hurt people. So you need radical candor, but radical candor only works when people know that you believe in them, that you trust them, that you see them for who they are, and you're going to support their visions. And that's how you bring this into your company. So in my company, I'm known for being very direct. If something is bad, I'll simply go, oh my God, this is shit. We got to redo this. But the people on my team, my writer, she knows she's cool because I've established that I deeply care about her. And she gets that. And so that's actually the relationship I have with my chief writer and with almost everyone in the company. Now, Gallup did a study on this, and they found that in a study of 10 million employees, employees who answered yes to the following question, my supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person, these were the most productive, they contributed more to profits, and were significantly more likely to stay with their company long term. So you want to get to radical candor? First, you've got to establish radical caring. Yes or yes? Okay, so summary, appreciation, unexpected gifts. Now, let's go through a summary of all seven points, okay? So you create attraction, find the right fit, create a common code, happiness, growth, meaning, and significance. Feel free to take a picture of that so you have it on your phone. And look, guys, I've shared some 22 ideas. I don't expect you to bring all of these into your company, but if you could bring one or two, especially the first 
two most powerful ones I mentioned, right? You already can make massive breakthroughs. Think about what that simple two-minute appreciation did for Gary Baker's company. It took revenues in one single year from 650 million to 950 million. So there's an incredible science in this. Now I want to teach you one final bonus idea before we wrap up, and that's called the all hands meeting. How do you create a team meeting that basically injects all of this into your company? So we do it, and we call it the awesomeness report. And it's really a time for celebration and a time for updating each other. Now what you do in the awesomeness report, the first thing is you celebrate victories. So um, people might state their new SEO score or a new record for the number of Instagram followers. And then we have a bell called the bell of awesomeness that is only to be rung in moments of sheer and total awesomeness. And you cannot just call it the bell. And if someone breaks a new record, they get to go up and ring that bell. And the average person will maybe ring that bell once in their career, but they will remember that for the rest of their life because it means they broke a new record. And then we might share praise from customers for our customer support staff. So these are all actually pictures, not of our customers, but of our customer support staff, the people answering emails, and what customers said about them. And this adds so much meaning to someone who is at an entry-level job in the company. Now, there's a reason we do these, these uh, awesomeness reports this way. Paul Marston's Mimetics and Social Contagion study showed that people ultimately follow their peers. And so, when you do an A report or an awesomeness report, and you are highlighting the best practices, the best behaviors, all the other people in the room, the junior employees, the newbies, you're giving them behaviors to model and follow. You're establishing the behavioral patterns of the company. So you're highlighting your best people. So one of your jobs is to constantly highlight your best people over and over and over and over and over again. Because you're giving breadcrumbs to success. You're giving breadcrumbs to the part of success for everybody else in the company. So that's number one, right? And that's about gratitude. It's about celebration. Now, number two is envisioning the future. You want to ensure that you are envisioning with your team how to be the best at what you do. So what we always do is we talk about the future. We talk about the new companies we want to build. We talk about the new products, the new features. We talk about being the greatest education company in the world. We repeat that and we repeat that and we repeat that. We're putting people, we're lighting a fire on the people's asses to do their best work and truly be best in the world. So awesomeness reports create happiness through celebration, growth through training, opportunities to reinforce meaning, and feelings of significance by being recognized and celebrated. Now, our goal is to create the world's greatest workplace in the world by 2020. And by the 2021, document this so that other companies can follow this. Because if we want to be the greatest education institution in the world, it's no longer about just changing schools and universities. We have to change the workplace. We have to change companies. Last year, Mindvalley officially launched Mindvalley for Business. We're now working with a range of incredible world-class companies to help shift culture. If any of you would like to speak to us about bringing these ideas into your company or bringing Mindvalley Quest into your company or creating situations in the company where your team members can actually get fitter, live longer, lose weight, we're developing those, those models. You can um, simply um, shoot an email to to corporate at mindvalley.com and someone from my team will, will answer your question. We've had people like you guys at Mindvalley U and like AFES bring us into many Fortune 500 companies in the last two months alone, just when we launched this. So, you know, we want to help serve the world by getting these ideas out. If you think these are useful, go ahead and just write to corporate at mindvalley.com. Now, of course, we still have a long way to go to be the world's greatest workplace. I don't even know how we measure that, right? But all we're doing is innovating as fast as we can, testing as fast as we can to try to get there. Because I want you to remember this number. 70% of our waking hours are spent at work. And work should really be, why not, the best, most hopeful, happiest times of our life. But there's a bonus when you do this. And that is really the, the impact on your employees. When you do this, you genuinely become a true leader because you're helping other people discover their best selves. The proudest thing I'm, I'm, I, I, I have is not our products, but it's the people in our company, what they've stepped up to, 
This guy over here became the managing director of 500 startups. This guy who was a lead UX designer became the lead UX designer for the most profitable cell phone company in the world. Everyone who pretty much works on our events team is a legend in their own right and is tackling on massive projects. That was Amir and his book, that's Cardi on stage. Uh, that's Amir speaking at the Oslo Freedom Summit. Um, you'll recognize Ola who joined us in customer support and today speaks on stage and gets a standing ovation from 800 people. You'll recognize Gotham and his 5 million views. Um, this is Eva, and this is a classic example. Eva was one of my top marketers, and I was given an opportunity to speak on stage at a digital marketing conference, and I told her, I want to share the stage with you. And so I shared the stage with her. This was at Yannick Silva's Underground DC conference in 2012. Today, you will see Eva by Sochka on your app, because today she's coming here. She now runs her own digital marketing firm, and she's coming here to be the official digital marketing teacher at Mind Valley U. So by creating these powerful people, you don't lose them. They may go and start their own business, but the stories will make even more powerful people come to you. Here are another couple of examples. You might, guys might recognize Lorenzo. Today, Lorenzo is working with Ben Greenfield and developing Mind Valley's um, fitness protocols. You might recognize Laura, who organized AFEST. That's Laura in an Estonian newspaper. There was one particular month back when we had 80 employees, where in one month, out of that 80 employees, 18 were either in press were either invited to speak somewhere or had gotten a book deal. 18 out of 80. Now imagine if you can do that, you become a company filled with superheroes. And when you can do this, your mission, whatever it is, however it is to serve the world, you now are not doing that mission alone. You now have rallied around a team of incredible, powerful individuals to help you take your vision, your dream, your idea, and expand it. And it becomes their dream and their idea. And together, you guys can conquer the world. So thank you, guys.